So why is permaculture so relevant today? We are right now in a crisis. It's kind of a big flashlight shining on to what we are doing today and, and how we are doing it. We were hearing maybe three years ago that the media was talking about in 12 years, we need to have, you know, we need to have everything, you know, figure out the shift in 12 years or else we are at the beyond, you know, point of no return. Well, when you look at the details of what they meant by those 12 years and they being the uh, IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, it's really that we needed to have all of our transport systems fundamentally overhauled, our food systems fundamentally overhauled, our energy systems fundamentally overhauled in that period of time, right? This is a huge, huge change that we need to achieve. So we are very much on a very bad path right now. We're talking about in COP20, COP22, COP21, all of these we're talking about two degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, currently we're not even on the business as usual track. We're on a track that's getting worse and worse. And it's aiming right now for a seven degree Celsius increase, which is really not attainable because there we don't even have climate data beyond five degrees Celsius increase. So there is records of the earth being five degrees warmer than it is today. And that's a hundred meter sea level rise. That is not feet, this 300 feet, it's the 100 meter sea level rise. That means you can go to the ocean instead of Montreal or instead of Toronto. In Toronto, you'll have an ocean's front beach, right? This is a big shift and it's not something that we can survive as a species. The earth will survive it, it has before, but we cannot achieve that as our end point. So we need some drastic change, right? There's major, major issues that we are facing. So what can we do about it, right? Okay, everything is on fire, the ship's sinking, panic. Yeah, we, I know you don't need more of that in your life. And we're going to get away from that really quickly because if we know there's a problem in permaculture, that is the, a good thing. If you don't know what your problem is, you've got it worse off than anyone else because you're just lost in it. And if you know what your problem is, we know where to start. So the problem being raising global temperatures, that is the greenhouse gases, which are carbon dioxide equivalents. So where do they come from? Looking at all of these, don't look at any of the small ones. Just look at the two big ones, electricity and food and land use. And what can you change most in your life? Electricity or food and land use? We can change our food. We can change the way that we engage with the land. We can demand organic from farmers, which actually that should be scratched because now it's demand regenerative because we are demanding organic and it has revolutionized our food production already in the last, you know, 20, 30 years that it's been um, be becoming a demand in our market. So this is where we need to focus. We can tackle a quarter of all of our sources of greenhouse gases just by looking at food and land use. Now, what of the earth is, a, what of the systems of the earth are able to absorb these CO2s naturally, these carbon dioxide equivalents, right? When I say carbon dioxide, I mean the equivalents, all of the NOx and SOx and methanes and all those things. So if you look at the biggest one here is the natural atmosphere, then we have the ocean, but even bigger than the ocean is the land. The actual earth itself, the soil, can hold 24% of all of the CO2s in the atmosphere get absorbed into the soil or, or can be held in the soil. So this is where they are absorbed and locked up for long term. So if we just look at, again, land and food-based strategies and solutions, we are tackling one quarter of the output and one quarter of the natural solution already just by improving these two points. So. We have a big problem, but we have a really big starting point, which is changing the way that we eat. One of the best kind of tools for helping to understand the climate crisis and where we're at and the solutions to moving forward, because there's there's endless amounts of information out there about what the climate crisis is and how bad it is. But if you look at Project Drawdown, it is the most comprehensive look at solutions all around the world. And here we have a diagram that shows all the different solutions and their impact is based on in the size. And there's 80 different solutions that they've identified that can be done, that can easily be done, um, that are not easily, but that we have solutions for and are, you don't have to invent some new technology like space mirrors. These all exist. These are all things we can deal with. Um, and everything that we put a smiley face beside is related to permaculture. 
right? So we have refrigeration, we have reducing food waste, we have plant-rich food diets, tropical forest management, silvopasture, regenerative agriculture, temperate forest systems, cons conservation agriculture, tree intercropping, geothermal and alternative energy, managed grazing systems, farmland rep restoration, improved rice cultivation, wind turbines, mul multi-strata agroforestry, right? Food forests, they're right in there. So all of these are areas that we can touch on as permaculturalists, as people who are taking ecology into the way that we design our future moving forward. If we just look at that first top ranking solution in the drawdown, project drawdown, this is gonna be a little bit of a twist of how conventionally you would solve these problems. So the number one is refrigerant management. What that means is where does your fridge go when it's done? Where does your, con your air conditioning unit go when it's done? And how do we manage the chemicals that are in those? So in a conventional sense, it means simply set up recycling programs all around the world to make sure that no fridge and no uh, air conditioner is left behind, right? And make sure they all get recycled and all that doesn't get into landfills, which is nice, but it's a big job. And so the permaculture approach to that is to question the inevitability of air conditioning, question the inevitability of refrigeration in all countries. Does anyone need a freezer right now today where you are if you're in Canada? Sorry. <laughs> You know, I, I took something out of the deep freeze in the garage and I didn't have time before the course to go run it back out of the garage. So it's sitting on a chair on my deck because it's minus 20 out. <laughs> so there's ways of designing homes actually that our great grandparents and grandparents did where there's integrated root cellars that reduce by 50% of the year anyway, our refrigeration and freezing needs. There are design systems like this image here. This is the Oasis Hotel and this hotel does not require air conditioning. And when you open the windows, there's this mesh this curtain of living vines that gives you this fresh air with all the positive ions that come from those plants as well wafting into your room so simply the design of this building has made it so that in singapore which is a place where you need air conditioning this building does not and so question the inevitability of the problem is one of the things we look at in permaculture and question the inevitability of what we define as the problem when you look at humans and our impact, we measure how many steaks you've eaten, how many times you've taken the airplane, how many kilometers you drive, uh, you know, how much energy you consume, how many devices you have, all of these being ways of reducing the negative impact that you have on the earth. Right? We look at how bad are you for the earth and how less bad can you be? Because we inevitably, in this mindset, look at humans as a negative impact on the earth. And so you need to be less of that, less of yourself in order to save the planet. When, if you look at the title of this article, this article is looking at new research that has shown that supposedly the pristine Amazon was an untouched pristine rainforest, but they found evidence of areas where the trees have actually been planted, the soil has actually been built. So there's areas where there's, you know, six centimeters of topsoil, and then there's six feet of topsoil right beside it, mixed with a biochar terra preta uh, combination, which is actually a prepared soil remediation mix from ancient times. So when we look at how to be human on earth today, we need to break beyond our current understanding of what it means to be human today. We need to look at our past because a species like humanity that's so cognitively confused and daydreaming in the stars could have only survived and thrived in an ecosystem that was fully abundant. And it could have only done so for so long if we were also creating abundance as we waxed and waned throughout the woods and the fields and the, and the, and the different ecosystems on this planet. So to understand that we are a negative impact is to mean that you don't understand your history. You don't understand the, the story, not, not just his story, but the story of the human species on Earth today. And there are lots of documentaries that are starting to show more and more how ecosystems depend. If you look at Earth, the New Wild is a series where they look at, you know, the earth as well as its interaction with humans there's herders in africa in western africa i can't remember if it was mali or senegal but where they dig these wells to feed their cattle water and then afterwards the elephants come and the hyenas come and the, all these animals are migrating with the farmer to the water wells and so there's massive ecosystems that are depending on these cattle herders you know we don't look at ourselves as having positive impact and so when we measure our ecological footprint we don't even ask how many more things you could do that are better for this earth right how many more grandmothers could you help with their email or, or their groceries even 
those social impacts are incredibly beneficial. How many you know trees have you planted in your life? That's not on the ecological footprint measuring. So if you want to know more about ecological living, ecological gardening as a basis, then a really great place to start is uh, there's a lot of free resources out there and we have a couple of them. There's also this two hour course of ours, which is an introduction to ecological gardening. So you want your garden not just to be, you know, a new task of watering and weeding, but you want it to be a productive, abundant ecosystem that feeds you as well as the soil, as well as the wildlife ecosystems and endangered species all around you, then that's a really great place to start.